This meeting is being recorded. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the September 21st meeting of the Berkeley Unified School District Board of Education. Ms. Charles, can you please begin with your spiel whenever you are ready? Good evening. Welcome. Uh, buenas noches. Bienvenidos. El siguiente mensaje será repetido en español. I will provide a brief overview of tonight's meeting. After a few procedural items, the board will hear 30 minutes of public comment. At the end of the meeting, there's a final, a second and final opportunity for public comment. So if you do not get to speak during this first call, we encourage you to stay and do so at the end. Uh, to participate in public comment, please raise your hand now by clicking on the participants button at the bottom of your screen. Select raise your hand. T to comment by phone, you will be prompted to raise your hand by pressing star nine. If you wait to raise your hand until the public comment begins, you may need to wait until the very end. So please raise your hand now if you wish to participate. The board president will usually call our students first. So if you are a student, uh, interested in speaking tonight, please say write student either before or after your name. The board president will also determine whether to set tonight's speaking time at one, two, or three minutes per speaker and on an individual basis has a discretion to allow extra time for those who need translation or have other needs. When your time has elapsed, you will see Vice President Brown, or you won't see Vice President Brown holding a sign. You There is a timer the, um, that will go off, so you'll know when your time will um, is about to elapse. Please finish your sentence, but don't try not to speak beyond your time. Um, voy a proporcionar un breve resumen detallando eh, el orden de esta reunión. Después de unos procedimientos preliminares, media hora, 30 minutos, será dedicado a comentarios de parte del público. Al final de la junta hay una segunda y última oportunidad para participar. So, si no puede participar durante la primera llamada, le animamos que se quede al, al final para poder participar. Para comentar por videoconferencia, a favor de levantar la mano, haciendo clic en el botón participantes en la parte de abajo de su pantalla y seleccione el botón levantar la mano. Para comentar por teléfono, puede levantar la mano presionando 9. Recuerde que si quiere participar, debe levantar la mano ya. Usualmente la presidenta llamará a los estudiantes primeros. Eh, ella otorgará uno, dos o tres minutos por orador. Eh, habrá una cuenta regresiva durante su comentario para que sepa cuánto tiempo le queda a favor de no pasarse de, de su tiempo. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Charles. Can you please call the role of the Board of Education? Um, and before you do, I just want to note that Director Julie Sinai has been excused from this evening's meeting. Noted. Uh, student Director Ian Siegel. Here. Director Ana Vasudev. Present. Director Ty Alper. Present. Vice President Laura Babbitt. Here. And President Khadija Brown. Present, thank you so much. Is there a motion to approve this evening's agenda? I'll move it. Moved by Vice President Babbitt. Is there a second? I'll second. Um, Seconded by uh, Director Alper. Ms. Charis, can you please call the roll? Director, Student Director Siegel? Yes. Director Alper? Yes. Director Vasudev? Yes. Uh, Vice President Babbitt? Yes. President Brown? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. The motion passes and our agenda this evening is approved. Uh, Ms. Ba D Vice President Babbitt, are you ready to report out from uh, closed session? Yes, thank you. Closed session began at 5.35 p.m. Um, all members were present, excluding Director Sinai. For item 3.1, we heard an update and gave direction for our special board meeting. We um, The item was moved by Director Alper, seconded by Director Vasudev, and voted unanimously in favor by all remaining board members present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice President Babbitt. Um, do you also need to report out from when the board uh, went to extended closed session after last week, uh, last the last meeting? Uh, sure, we came back from closed session and um, for that item, we heard an update and gave direction. 
Thank you so much, Vice President Babbitt. Uh, we will now move to our first opportunity for public comment. As Ms. Shara said in her opening, if you are here to speak to the Board of Education tonight and you are a student, please ensure that you put student or S by your name so that you may be given priority to speak. Right now, I see that we only have a few hands up, so each speaker will be given uh, three minutes to speak. We are going to begin our speaking period now, and I'm going to politely ask that no one uh, else raise their hand after we've begun, we've begun our speaking period. So we're going to start with Monique Duncan Harris, followed by Mati Tiblum, and our last public speaker uh, for this evening will be Stephen McGongle. Ms. Charles, can you please promote our first speaker? Hello. My name is Monique Duncan Harris, and I'm a math teacher and math department chair at Berkeley High School. I want to speak on behalf of the BFT's contract proposal regarding pay for individualized education program meetings that fall outside of the duty day. I've been a full inclusion math teacher in the district for nine years. Our duty as full inclusion teachers includes collaborating with our case managers and specialists in order to set our students up for success. In order to stay in compliance, since IEP meetings are a legal mandate, I have attended IEP meetings during my lunchtime and outside of my workday. Just last year, I attended 48 IEP meetings, and of those, 20 of them were outside of the duty day. Many of these meetings I had to attend while driving to pick up my own children from daycare. I was not paid for this time. I am unable to attend IEP meetings during the day that are not during my prep period due to lack of sub coverage. Our case managers have a difficult time getting the general education teachers to attend IEP meetings because of lost instructional time, no substitutes, and um, availability um, outside of the duty day with no compensation. Neighboring districts pay participants for IEP meetings outside of our workday, and I ask Berkeley to do the same. Thank you. Thank you as well. Next, we will have Mati Tiblum followed by Rebecca Levinson. Hello, and uh, thank you for allowing me uh, the opportunity to uh, speak here tonight. Um, meeting minutes. The reason I uh, wanted to uh, join uh, tonight's meeting was to see what exactly was uh, there in the meeting minutes regarding the discussion and the direction that the board gave um, regarding the Milvia parking at the last meeting. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the meeting minutes are not on the in the packet. Um, so brings me to two thoughts. One is it should be removed from the consent calendar. Uh, B, I think the board should make uh, and the district should make a, a serious effort because this is not the first time um, meeting minutes have to be in the packet. Uh, this board cannot operate, direct, and act in a timely fashion without actually having actionable meeting minutes. So to the topic of uh, what was discussed and what were the directions uh, in regards to the Milvia parking at the last meeting, um, what I heard was uh, Director Babbitt and I believe other directors joining in requesting uh, facilities department to move forward full steam in exploring alternative parking solutions for Berkeley Unified. If this was not clear, uh, it has to be made clear tonight because uh, facilities is moving full steam forward with the parking structure and the tennis structure uh, they see as approved and directed and a go ahead. Uh, with meetings going on uh, last week, this week, uh, next week. And regarding that uh, uh, discussion last thing last week, Kind of let me left me scratching my head. How come with so little work, twenty nine thousand dollars worth of work done in the interim time, so many understandings have been reached? 
if if the bridge uh, bridging documents architect only was paid for um, putting together those massing studies, uh, according to Director Kali's last uh, meeting, then how come all this information, all this plethora of information that was not paid for and therefore assumed to have been available before or easily reachable before, why was it not used? I'm still pondering why exactly uh, uh, Director Alper and Director Sinai were thanking uh, facilities for reconsidering. The consideration was should have been given at the first place and this project should not have been moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will have Rebecca Levinson followed by Alex Day. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Welcome. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. So good evening, um, Superintendent. Good evening, board. My name is Rebecca Levinson. I am the mother of a ninth grader, and I am one of the two adult advisors to Berkeley High School Stop Harassing. I've been working with survivors of sexual harm at Berkeley High School for the last seven years. And I want to start tonight with um, two compliments. One is if you in the audience, I see there's about 40 of you, if you haven't had a chance to meet our Title IX coordinator, um, I have to tell you, I don't think I've been as thoroughly thrilled <laughs> in the seven years that I've been working with the USD as I was when I met her. I think she embodies every single thing that we want to see in terms of empathy and Students use the word love to describe Yasmina, and I think um, if you meet her, you will too. So we did a really good job on this hire, and I want to thank everyone. The second thing I want to notice is that finally this year, we actually had teacher training around sexual harassment and sexual harm that was specific to teaching. And I thought my phone blew up. People were so excited about it. The last thing I want to talk about is um, Matt Bissell. So as we all know, um, unfortunately, Matt Bissell was allowed to perpetrate on students in BUSD for decades. And one of the things that I've really been thinking about is, um, I think sometimes we, we think about these cases as a one and done. And, and really, if you look at the Department of Education um, ed report, we'll see that 10% of students will be ex have experienced sexual harm by the time they graduate from high school. We know this is a huge problem. And I've really been thinking about our commitment as a school district to restorative practices. So I have a suggestion because we, we and the district were all part of knowing that Bissell in some way, shape or form, whether you were the superintendent or the board, we knew, and so did BFT. And one of the things that I want us to think about as a community is going forward together, BFT, our city council, our board, and saying to California and our ed board that we wanna change the threshold for how we hold teachers accountable when there are acts of sexual harm. And I, I want us to think about um, doing that in the name of every single survivor that was harmed by Matt Bissell in the case that's coming forward. And I, I, we're, we're in 2022, we have you know, known pedophiles in our schools and we have the same threshold for a teacher who maybe isn't a great math teacher around the, the discipline process as we do for a serial predator. I'd like to see us do better and differently. Thank you. Thank you as well. At next, we will have Alex Day followed by Ann Caligari. Um, hello, everybody, and Berkeley Unified School Board Superintendent 
Republic. Um, my name is Alex Day, and I'm an ethnic studies and social living teacher in the U9 at Berkeley High School. I'm also a Berkeley High graduate and a parent of a kindergartner at Ruth Acti. Um, I'm here today to talk about BFT's proposals around healthcare. Um, so healthcare for me takes about 16% of my gross salary and a much larger proportion of my actual take home pay for my family of three on Kaiser, which as you might know is our, our cheapest plan. Uh, though rent on its own is outrageous, the cost of healthcare would have been a major factor in us moving far away long ago without the family connection for housing that has kept me and my family in Berkeley. Beyond my particular story, healthcare costs are a major piece of the educator retention crisis that BUSD faces. Healthcare is due to go up another 7% in January, which employees need to cover 3.5% of that increase. This is after a 3% uh, employee contribution increase last year. So in the past two years, I'm paying $1,600 a year more for the same healthcare out of my paycheck. Colleagues of mine who come from Oakland Unified, where healthcare is paid for with zero employee contributions, have said that despite our higher salaries here, their take home pay is higher or the same in OUSD compared to Berkeley. Even though on paper it may seem like our teachers make more in BUSD than Oakland, after we pay our share of healthcare costs, if you need health benefits, coming to our district is a pay cut. And that's really important, not only because Oakland's next door, but a lot of my colleagues live in Oakland. Um, so, you know, if they can get the same money with a less commute, see what I'm saying? So clearly our for-profit model of healthcare is broken. However, we can't wait for the organizing around single payer to bear fruit at the state or national level. Level. We need a stopgap now, which at the very least should be increasing the hard cap on employee contributions to healthcare to cover more of this most recent cost of healthcare. In the medium term, I also strongly urge everyone listening to this to support the revived proposal for CalCare, a state level um, single payer health insurance system in California, when it comes up in the new legislation, legislative session, excuse me, in Sacramento in January 2023. Um, not only would a single payer system give the 65% of BFT members on district health care immediate financial relief, it would also put all of BUSD's employer contributions back into the general fund to support our students. Besides, it would just be better health care overall. The California Nurses Association supports it strongly. Um, anyway, uh, as long as we have an employer-based system, for now, the employer, BUSD, needs to do their part to keep healthcare affordable for our employees. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you as well. Next, we will have um, Ann Caligari followed by Rachie Lee. Hi, Ann. Welcome. You can unmute whenever you are ready. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There we are. Good evening, board members, superintendent, and members of the public. I am Ann Caligari, the former leader of the Office of Family Engagement and Equity. During my eight years with the district in this capacity, my department's goals were always to educate, empower, and equip parents to successfully partner with BUSD to reach our shared goals of student success. We worked hard to convince parents to join school site councils, PACs, PTAs, and other affinity-based groups within BUSD. Once they joined, we also supported parents because they needed to be in the room to make a difference. That was our charge from the district. So when the Berkeley Parents Union formed with the intention of informing voters who they believed would best represent the interests of BUSD, I was honored to support them. And in response to this effort, hearing rumors that people should be afraid of parents who offered their titles as participants in these very same committees was disheartening to say the least. We know firsthand that parents have felt retaliation or retaliated against for advocating for their children or school community. 
I know multiple parents advocates on whom CPS was called. Parents who were denied services that were offered to other people's children who never fought for them. And I know parents who felt uncomfortable speaking out, period, out of fear for the safety of their children at school. The question should not be, is the, Bar the Berkeley Parents Union potentially bad because they did not identify themselves? The question should be, why didn't parents feel comfortable identifying themselves? To have an LCAP goal of welcoming school environments and then promote fear and division from the highest levels of our organization is unacceptable. Board members should be the first people to know the character of the parents within BUSD who serve in these committees that advise the board and make budgetary decisions which impact every school. Parents are the people who have proven with their votes, time, and taxes that they support a diverse board, equity, increase in staff pay, and public schools. Now that they're taking it to the next level to ensure voters in this city have a data point that includes their voice for our elected leaders, all I can say is I retired having done my job. Thank you very much. Thank you as well. Uh, next, we will have Rachie Lee followed by Eddie Alvarez. You can unmute whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Boy, it is hard to follow that. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, hi, my name is Rachie Lee, and I'm a mom to a sixth grader at King and a fourth grader at Rosa Parks. I'm speaking to you tonight as a parent um, and a private citizen. I want to extend a thank you to district staff and the school board for the work you put in to finalize the project labor agreement between the district and the building trades council that will allow construction projects for the district to be built with union labor, fair wages, safe and appropriate working conditions, and importantly, building standards that protects our students and the public. The PLA is also a large step towards supporting working families and keeping our jobs in our community. So kudos to you. I'm especially excited about the terms pertaining to the expansion of our career technical education programming, which will create more opportunities for our students to be exposed to the breadth of construction related trades. Many of these trades require expertise in math, engineering, science, design, and project management. As a parent, I very much look forward to learning about how this program develops. Thank you very much. Thank you also. Next, we will have Eddie Alvarez, followed by Molly uh, Bluestein. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so we can hear you just fine. Welcome, Eddie. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Superintendent. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Um, on behalf of our 28 affiliates and our over 10,000 construction workers uh, that build Alameda County uh, and uh, thankfully build uh, Berkeley Unified and most of the city of Berkeley. Uh, I rise tonight to speak in favor of the project labor agreement. As the previous caller said, uh, it's hard for me to actually um, she kind of took my line to be quite honest with you. And <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you to John Calise and, and his staff uh, for getting this deal done. It was a, a, a robust process um, that, uh, that took us a, a little bit longer than, uh, than, than we thought, but uh, I think all the, uh, everything got ironed out that uh, needed to get ironed out. I want to thank uh, our staff for making sure that uh, we got him. The, the, the big thing that I see, the, as the previous uh, caller said, the expansion of the career technical uh, education um, uh, component, which is something that both sides, and especially Mr. Calise, hammered on uh, that we really put some teeth into. Um, we want to make sure that the people that are building Berkeley Unified look like Berkeley, uh, and this is going to help with that. And then only that, but the people that are building your Berkeley Unified are the best skilled and trained workers. 
uh, in all of America. Uh, our, our folks go through the most rigorous training, uh, mostly through a, a three to five year apprenticeship. Um, and uh, as I said, um, uh, really take good pride uh, in what they do. Uh, and we take a lot of pride in the city of Berkeley, especially Berkeley Unified. They're a long partner uh, with us and we appreciate that partnership. And we look forward to you voting yes tonight um, on this project labor agreement. And we look, look and we um, appreciate working, excuse me, working in the future with you on many other projects, including housing uh, for the teachers uh, and any other project that may come up. So I just wanna thank John and his staff and the rest of the board staff uh, to make sure this, get, this deal gets done. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you as well, Eddie, good to see you. Next, we will have uh, Molly Bluestein followed by our last public commenter this evening, which is gonna be Stephen McConnell. Um, hi, I'm Molly Bluestein. I am a um, third grade teacher at Cragmont and a Berkeley High graduate from 2004. Um, I am talking, I'm speaking about the um, um, healthcare costs to teachers in Berkeley Unified. Um, I am lucky enough to have roots here and, you know, be a fifth generation East Bay resident and therefore have support to stay here with my, um, um, with my family. But um, with rising house ha um, housing costs and um, our, my own contributions to my, to my family's health care, it is making it more and more difficult. Um, I pay $1,100 a month um, for health insurance for myself, my husband, and my three-year-old daughter. Um, and that is, that is money that could be going towards um, a, um, a, you know, a place of our, to, to buy a house um, in the Bay Area possibly, or um, to be, Mal can you pause Molly's time, please? Molly, we can still hear you, but I see you, but I can't hear you. Oh, oh, my internet is unstable. That's okay. We've paused your time. Um, if you want to just go back two sentences. Um, yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, That's okay. And I lost my chance. But it's um, that's money that could be um, that would make it so we are not living paycheck to paycheck, and um, which is difficult for um, for being in a profession where I had to do extra schooling and pay that out of pocket as well. Um, I love Berkeley. I went to school through thirteen years, you know, kindergarten through twelfth grade. And um, I love living in the Bay Area, but it's unsustainable for me and my family if we're, I'm gonna be paying over $12,000 a year, um, over $13,000 a year for health insurance. And as Alex Day said earlier, trying to wait for that single payer health care to become a reality is not feasible, especially with the three, Point um, five percent increase that teachers are going to be seeing next year. Thank you, Molly. Thank you for joining us. Our last public commenter this evening will be Stephen McGonagall. Excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Perfect. Uh, good evening. My name is Steve McGonigal, and I'm in my second year of being a special education case manager at Berkeley High School and my fifth year as a teacher overall. I'm here tonight to emphasize the importance of providing compensation for participants in IEP meetings, which occur outside of the duty day, such as after school. Allowing for compensated IEP meetings are important for many reasons, 
but primarily to ensure that IEP meetings are held in compliance with both state and federal laws. The Individuals with Disabilities Act requires that each IEP meeting be held with the following members in attendance. The parents of a child with a disability, at least one general education teacher, at least one special education teacher, a representative of the local education agency, such as a vice principal or a program supervisor, related service providers, and the student. Ensuring that each one of these mandatory participants are able to meet at some point during the very busy and compacted school day proves to be a challenging, if not impossible task, which often places a huge strain on case managers such as myself to provide coverage for individuals that are missing class periods to attend the meeting. This is not to mention that holding the meetings during the school day mandates that students will have an entire class period or more without their regular teacher, as the expectation is that general education teachers are present for the duration of the meeting, which could potentially lead to learning loss over time. I would estimate that I have held approximately 15 IEP meetings after school in the last calendar year, the majority of which have had much greater attendance from general education teachers and other IEP team members overall. The sustainability of placing this level of demand on IEP participants is not a positive one, however, and places many people in roles such as myself in difficult situations involving IEP compliance, work-life balance, and burnout. There should be a balance of when these meetings take place to best meet the needs, needs of students and families. To achieve this balance, I ask the board to consider compensating educators like they do in nearby districts when our legally mandated duties extend beyond the duty day for the convenience and flexibility of some of our most at-risk students and families. Thank you. Thank you also. That ends our public comment period for this evening. Um, please keep in mind that we have a second opportunity for public comment uh, towards the end of the meeting. But at this time, we are going to move to our committee comments. Are there any committee com comments this evening? Okay. Seeing none, we will now move to our union comments. Um, and I believe that I have the video um, for our BFT union comment. Um, and I had it open and ready to go. Okay, here we are. And I'll share that now. Hello, Superintendent Ford Morthel and the BUSD Board. I am Matt Meyer, President of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers. Teachers have been so excited to be able to connect with caregivers at the elementary and middle school back to school nights. We're thrilled to see our high school parents and guardians tomorrow. It really feels like this year is off to a great start. Some of our priorities right now are making sure that our employees are being paid correctly and on time. We've been working with human resources to streamline information requests and get problems solved in a timely manner. Some of the investments our district has made in updating our backend systems are paying off. We're also being proactive to make sure that there is sub coverage when people are out and when teachers have to attend meetings during the school day. We want to maximize the time that teachers are in class with their students. Additionally, Berkeley High, there's a noticeable positive school culture shift from last year. As you know, we've been making lots of progress with our contract negotiations. There are still a handful of issues that we need to resolve. All of our neighboring districts that have concluded bargaining are getting between 6% and 10.25% raises for this current year. The district offer is on the low end of these agreements and we will fall further behind our neighbors when looking at current numbers. We have open positions right now in, we have an elementary classroom, PE classroom, high school math classroom, and many interns who are in the middle of getting their preliminary credentials. We even have to rely on expensive contractors for case managers, which is bad for our students with IEPs as these people are temporary and will leave. It has gotten harder and harder to fill positions and if a candidate drops out that we intend to hire, there's no one to fill their spot. 
25% of our certificated employees were hired in the past two years, and without fundamental changes, this trend will continue. We need to give people a reason to stay in this profession. Our love for our job and our students only keeps us so long year after year as our real wages have declined and pushed people out. Our healthcare costs have gone up 13% in two years. This has meant that our take-home pay has gone down since employees cover a large proportion of these incomes. We believe that the district should cover the same proportion of health care regardless of family size. There should not be a family penalty in our district. We're also the only bargaining unit in our district that does not have cash in lieu. Every other district that I know of offers this to employees not on district benefits, including our own district, to everyone but teachers. We are not discussing that point now, but it is a push out factor when comparing how sustainable our jobs are here to other neighboring districts and makes it harder to recruit. Oakland and Albany fully pay for health care coverage, and when you subtract the employee contribution to health care, teachers in Oakland now make more than teachers in Berkeley when you're looking to take home pay. We hope that you understand these changes in the labor market and underlying economic conditions. All of our proposals solve problems and work towards supporting our staff and students. Thank you. I don't see any other unions represented this evening for comments. So we will now turn it over to the Board of Education for their comments. Um, Director Siegel, Student Director Siegel, would you like to begin? Thank you, President Brown. Uh, first off, thanks uh, to everyone that came for public comment. Uh, I, wanted to thank, I wanted to thank the Berkeley PTSA for putting on the school board candidate forum last night. I appreciate all the students, parents, and teachers who came to learn about the candidates. I want to also praise President Brown for her amazing and insightful words, and I encourage all that couldn't make it to check out the recording, which should be coming out soon. Last Monday, I held my first ever office hours at Berkeley High and had great success. Uh, students came with ideas to create new murals at BHS and to further our commitment to addressing climate change. I want the Berkeley community to know that students are active and invigorated to start new things and take on new issues. There are a few student-led events coming up in the following weeks. There is a reproductive justice protest on September uh, Wednesday, September. September 28th from 10 to 12 at Civic Center Park. And on October 12th, there is a climate summit held by student activists. I'm looking forward to our discussions tonight and hearing from our amazing Title IX coordinator. Thank you. Thank you, Student Director Siegel. Uh, next, we will go to Director Vasudev, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Thanks, uh, President Brown. I uh, just wanted to, <laughs> wanted to thank everyone for coming to tonight's board meeting especially to our educators who came out to speak um, and to just share uh, what's what are some of their thoughts around um, compensation. Just appreciate hearing you uh, tonight, shedding, shedding a light on your issues. Um, I don't have many comments tonight other than to say uh, happy Latinx Heritage Month, uh, Feliz Mes de la, de la Herencia Latina para todas nuestras familias en el distrito. I know that our superintendent will be making some comments about that, so I, I won't steal her thunder, but <laughs> but I did. I just wanted to give a shout out to the district staff for doing a beautiful job with uh, posters about our Latinx staff. I don't know if you've seen them hanging out on our campuses, but I posted some photos on social media yesterday. It was I had a lot of fun, the Cragmont uh, Latinx staff uh, decorating the walls of the school and I'm putting up the, the beautiful visuals that our district uh, staff made. So I just wanted to give a shout out because I know it's a, a lot of hard work and to our teachers for sharing their beautiful narratives. There's so much that they're doing at the beginning of the year. And um, I appreciate looking at, you know, the pictures of, of our educators when they were little and, you know, the, their path. And I know that our students are gonna love seeing uh, seeing themselves uh, reflected in, in, in a lot of those narratives too. So th thank you for all the educators that, that worked on those. Uh, I continue to enjoy seeing our students back on campuses. So today before the board meeting, I was at King at the race uh, track, just kind of um, looking at all the cross country teams. I was, you know, there were teams from all over the East Bay. Of course, I was there cheering for our three middle schools, uh, for Willard, you know, Longfellow, King. Love seeing uh, all, our, our, all our little cross country students get ready and, and race it was wonderful. Um, and so I just love seeing our sports back in action, our students back in action made me really proud. And uh, thank you to all our parents too, who go out and uh, you know bring extra snacks for our athletes and make them feel loved and appreciated. 
Um, I also wanted to announce that I'm having office hours this weekend on Sunday from 9 to 10 at Lavender Bakery on Solano. Uh, looking forward, I know that I have some uh, educators that are going to be coming to those office hours that have already reached out. Uh, but even if you can't make it, you know, Sunday's prime family time, if you can't, if you can't make it, uh, shoot me an email. I still uh, will make myself available to meet uh, with any constituents that, that have any concerns, um, particularly our families as the beginning of the year starts. I want to hear how it's going, what we can do better as a district. I love when parents bring their students to my office hours. They're not shy about telling me about, you know, our, our lunch program, what can be improved. <laughs> I love hearing from students too. So if you're going to bring your little ones, uh, let them uh, share their opinions about our schools because we're here to serve them. And, and I love when, uh, when students come to office hours. It makes me super happy. And I really look forward to our presentation tonight on wellness and safety in our schools. This is a huge topic. It's an ongoing conversation. Um, obviously, like the discussion that we're going to have tonight is not enough time for this topic. And so um, I know that's something we're going to revisit as a district, um, but I'm really looking forward to hearing the presentation and also um, the comments that I'm sure my peers will give and um, to our continued effort to, to improve on the wellness and safety of our students in our schools. So thank you all. Thank you, Director Vasudev. Uh, next, we will go to Director Alper. Thanks, President Brown. I don't have any comments tonight, but I appreciate everybody who came out to um, watch our meeting and give public comment. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Vice President Babbitt. Um, yes, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so much has happened over these past few weeks. It seems it's been a long time since I've been on this virtual dais. With the few minutes that I have, I wanna first thank our students and staff who participated in the Mental Health Summit this past Saturday. I wanna honor the students from BHS and our own uh, student director who facilitated the um, candidates forum last night. And I wanna honor our students from uh, Berkeley High School. I recently learned that they won the national debate and are actually number one in the nation. They are champions. And so we celebrate and honor you this evening. Next, I would like to move to some very serious remarks for your consideration this evening. Unbought and unbossed was the campaign theme of my political hero, U.S. Rep. Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman to be elected to the United States Congress. In 1972, she ran for the Democratic nomination for president. Ridiculed by the largely white male party establishment, Chisholm knew she would lose but she used her coalition of delegates to advance the rights of women, black and indigenous people at a time when segregationist George Wallace was contending for the same nomination. Long accustomed to working against the establishment and its moneyed endorsement, Chisholm demonstrated how to leverage the tools of democracy to win power. It is with this Chisholm in mind that I proudly supported the launch of the Berkeley Parents Union. Many of you have heard labels that have been placed on this group as divisive, anti-union, anti-teacher, or mysteriously funded by nefarious sources. Throwing labels on people, especially parents within our district, is unacceptable. I haven't met any true George Wallace or glaring Trumpster in Berkeley, California. A majority of people of color board elected, not by a district, but by the entire city just does not support this fear. Now, that doesn't mean racism does not exist, but how it exists is already built into our institution. Focusing on amplifying parent voices is exactly what we need. As a longtime parent advocate for equity and results who became a board advocate, I learned a while ago, schools don't mind parents helping with a bake sale or coming to grade papers, but asking for basic improvements can change the entire tone of your invitation to support. This month, as we celebrate Latinx Heritage Month, let's take time to remove the labeling. Last year, I spoke of another leader I admired for his courage, Edward James Olmos, whose Latinx students from East LA were labeled cheaters when they all passed the AP calculus exam. The label, which became the belief, was so accepted by the system the students agreed to take the test again under even more pressure and scrutiny to pass. This month, as we celebrate Latinx Heritage Month, let's celebrate people's right to organize, as Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta provided. 
Let's celebrate leveling the playing field. Let's build community and truly partner in improving the lives of everyone, especially our students. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Babbitt. Uh, good evening, everyone. My comments are going to be uh, super short, but I first have to uh, start off by giving um, an appreciation to all of those who came out, uh, especially those who came out for public comment. We know that we, you are taking uh, time away from your families and from your loved ones to be here and to be active and engaged in our community, and we do not take that lightly. So thank you so much for being here. Next, I'd like to give a shout out to our student director, Ian, as well as students Jonathan and Anjani, who moderated an excellent endorsement panel uh, led by the PTSA this uh, la yesterday evening. Uh, in my comments, I said that B BUSD is the birthplace of activism, social change, social action, and that our students are the creme de la creme, the cream of the crop. And their work last night was evident of that. So major shout out to you, Ian, uh, for the ways that you are leading our young people in our school community. Next, I'd like to uh, officially wish all of you a happy Latinx Heritage Month. Uh, Latinx Heritage Month is celebrated every year from September 15th to October 15th, and it is our opportunity to celebrate and recognize the contributions and the influence of Latinx individuals to, uh, to the history, culture, and the achievements uh, mm -hmm. here in the United States. And so uh, this Latinx history, Latinx Heritage Month, and every Latinx Heritage Month, I lead an amazing project with my students about Latinx scientists and their contributions to our society. And there we talk about uh, zoologists and astronomers, and we get to educate ourselves, our families, and our school community about the powerful, impactful, strong, smart, and groundbreaking Latinx scientists that graced our entire world. So in your time, I encourage you to learn about scientists like uh, Ellen Ochoa, the first Latinx woman to ever go into space, Albert Baez, the physicist who uh, co-invented the X-ray reflection microscope, Carlos Juan Finley, the Cuban-born doctor and scientist who is nationally recognized uh, as a pioneer in the study of yellow fever. I promise you that with this research, you will be inspired just as I was or just as I am going to be and just as my students um, will be as well. And so uh, with that, my comments are, of course, incredibly short, but I did want to take that opportunity to um, to highlight Latinx Heritage Month and our student director. Additionally, I know that there are a lot of celebrations that I'm sure Superintendent Gordon Worthel will get to in our comments um, that are happening this month or have already started uh, this month. And I encourage you families to please visit um, our schools, please be engaged. Uh, families and our community members with the events that are coming up. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Superintendent Gordon Worthel for your comments. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, BUSD community. So as you've heard, we have kicked off the celebration of Latinx Heritage Month on September 15th with teaching resources for our staff and a family guide that we've shared with all of our BUSD families. So I hope everyone has received that. Um, and we continue to have those resources and other resources on our website. So please check out our Latinx resource webpage. We also have beautiful posters featuring our Latinx staff and are now featured at our schools and buildings across our district so we can celebrate all the richness and diversity that we have within our classrooms and our school communities. I am excited. Thank you, Director Vasudev, for not stealing my thunder. I get to announce that we are having a Latinx Heritage Month community event, um, Nuestra Gente, our people. And so I hope you will join the BUSD staff, students, families, and community members for this special event, which will be held on Saturday, October 15th at Longfellow Middle School from 11 to 2 p.m. We're going to have some real good food, engaging performances, and we can receive, you can receive if you choose, a free COVID-19 vaccine or booster provided by Lifelong Medical Care. Um, this event will be held just as the Night Next Heritage Month comes to a close, um, and it will give us an opportunity to continue to uplift and affirm our BUSD Latinx community throughout the year. 
Uh, President Brown said I was going to share a lot of events. I'm only going to share two. Our school sites are also uh, celebrating Latinx Heritage Month in a number of different ways. Again, check out our website and the school websites. But wanted to highlight two. I know that Emerson Elementary School is holding a Latinx reading night on October 11th. And that's where families will be invited to share their Latinx cultural stories. And this is an amazing way, not just to hear stories, but to share stories. Um, and then Oxford Elementary School students are enjoying Latinx literature as well in their classrooms and library, and will soon be uh, advertising and sharing um, access to a Latinx month um, assembly. So I will continue to update our community on the many ways that we're celebrating the richness and diversity of the Latinx diaspora, but I do encourage you to continue to look at our website for more updates. We know tons of things are happening in our community. And so on our website, we're not just highlighting what's happening within BUSD and hosted by BUSD, but some of the events that our uh, partners in Berkeley are hosting as well. I also am happy to celebrate that our COVID-19 cases uh, continue to remain low. So we are still providing our response testing for our close contacts to a case at every school and also offering testing for all staff and students at our Curtis Street entrance to the Berkeley Adult School. And that is on Mondays through Fridays from 10.30 to 6.30 p.m. We've also added um, with our partnership from Carbon Health, 50 additional appointments to this Saturday's COVID vaccine clinic that's held at the district's Franklin Preschool. So I will say that even though we've added those additional 50, um, the demand is high and this clinic is almost full. So please, um, if you're interested, uh, look on our website to get more information. We have additional clinics at our preschools as well on the following two Saturdays, um, this Saturday and the following Saturday. And then that Latinx uh, heritage celebration will have a clinic on October 15th as well. Um, again, visit our Berkeley COVID vaccine webpage for more information about how to receive an appointment and where these boosters and vaccinations can be found. Just wanted to say that even though I said that the cases are remaining low, one reason our clinics are busy is that, um, I've never said this right, the Bevalent COVID-19 booster was recently approved. So there is a new booster and it provides better and additional protection against uh, both the original strain of COVID-19 and the Omicron variant. So we are having um, longer lines and fuller appointments as folks are rushing in to get that additional vaccination. Last night, I hosted the first listening and learning community meeting and I was expecting hundreds of y'all to show up, at least the 25 that RSVP'd, but we had an amazing, strong, mighty group of three. All good. I appreciate there was another event that I just heard about going on. I'm looking at you, uh, Madam President, and some of the other folks who were at that event. Um, but we are hosting another one. I'm hosting another one. So you have all the time to make it up to me. Our next one will be on Friday, September 30th. It is not an evening event. This one will be hosted in the morning hours. So it's at 1130 in our boardroom building on September 30th, that is in person. And then we'll be hosting another one um, that is a Zoom call on Wednesday, October 5th. So appreciate the folks three that came out. Looking forward to engaging with more of you again uh, on our September 30th in person or on October 5th. And definitely looking forward to seeing many of you at our school sites as we celebrate Latinx history and our event on October 15th. That's the end of my comments, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you as well, Superintendent Ford Morthel. And I promise that that three, although strong and mighty, will turn, hopefully turn into 30 on September 30th. So thank you so much for just engaging our community, and the opportunity uh, to listen and to learn about what we are doing well here in BUSD and also all of the things that we can do to continue to progress. So thank you, Superintendent for more though. Mm -hmm. uh, at this time, can I please uh, have a motion to approve this evening's consent calendar? Oh, so President Brown, we need to um, take the minutes, uh, which is 11.16. We need to pull them because they're not posted from the consent calendar. And I okay. think that's all. Well, we would have had to pull another issue, but um, since Director uh, Sinai is absent, we can move forward with the other items. Okay, Vice President Babbitt is requesting that 11.16 be removed from the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve this evening's consent calendar with the necessary corrections? I will move to approve it with um, the I'll move it. Um, yeah, I'll second <laughs> Okay, it's been moved by Vice President Babbitt, seconded by Director Alfred. Uh, Ms. Charles, can you please call the roll? 
Director Siegel? Yes. Director Vasudev? Yes. Director Alper? Yes. Vice President Babbitt? Yes. And President Brown? Yes. Thank you so much. The motion passes. Uh, next, we will move to our first and only discussion item of the evening, and this will be our wellness and safety uh, update for Berkeley Unified School District. And so I'm excited to hear this update. Um, I know that a lot of our community members uh, have been asking to hear this update, and so I'm excited for the opportunity to be responsive to the needs of our community and excited to receive the presentation. Uh, Superintendent Fort though, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Thank you, Madam President. Um, we are waiting for the presentation to be loaded. There we are. So a good evening again, community uh, This and, and board directors. Uh, this evening, uh, staff will share some updates on our efforts to tend to students' wellness and safety. This presentation will highlight our efforts in three key areas, um, mental health and wellness supports, safety, and Title IX. Next slide, please. You might notice a trend by now that I always think it's important for us to ground ourselves in our collective why. That's our four E's, excellence, equity, engagement, and enrichment. And of course, our mission, which is to enable and inspire our diverse student body to achieve academic excellence and make positive contributions to the world. Um, we know that this mission cannot be accomplished if our students are not whole and well, and if our school communities are not places where they feel seen and safe. So as we share these updates, I wanna note that these are highlights and not a comprehensive representation of all of our efforts, but I do hope that you all hear how we are centering the experience of our babies, we're being responsive to the needs, the ask of our students, how we're committed to continuous improvement in these efforts, and how we are trying to focus not just on being responsive or reactive, but also proactive and preventative. And so with that, I'm going to pass the mic to our first presenter, who is going to be uh, Dr. Philip Shelley, who's going to share some of our efforts around mental health and wellness supports. Dr. Shelley. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. Um, good evening, uh, uh, board and community. Um, I'm going to be presenting on mental health and wellness support. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide represents some of what was done in, in 21-22 school year and the plans moving forward for 22-23 school year. I'll touch upon each of these in upcoming slides, but before I get into it, I want to just briefly talk about some of the preventative work that's being done at our sites. Um, our cost teams are at each site, continue of support teams at each site regularly meet to discuss students, their needs, and to make recommendations for support. There's also the uh, SEL or social emotional learning work and the preventative supports that are being provided by some of our community partners, which I'll touch upon as well. Um, for example, Lifelong uh, provides full class support consisting of community building and regulation strategies such as zones of regulation, in addition to the other social emotional work that they're doing. Uh, BACR does whole class tier one supports, in addition to restorative justice, check in and check outs, and then classroom presentations, and in addition to the different uh, therapy modalities that they use, as well as playground and classroom supports to develop skills and health. And then there's some of the preventative work uh, around mindfulness that's provided by the Nairoga Institute to both students and staff. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide uh, uh, shows some of the partnerships that we have um, with some of our community partners represented by BACR, Child Therapy Institute, and Lifelong Medical, in addition to our partnership with the Nairoga Institute and the city of Berkeley and some of the local uh, colleges and universities. Um, the MOUs have been signed, and so the work has begun on, on our school sites. Um, in addition to uh, uh, some of the things I just mentioned, there's also the Prevention and Early Intervention Grant with the City of Berkeley that actually funds uh, some of our programs, such as the, the work with Nairoga Institute with Dynamic Mindfulness, our Supportive Schools programs, which is uh, provides funding that, that assists with paying uh, for our community partners to come in and work with our students, BACR, Child Therapy Institute, and Lifelong Medical. That's across our elementary schools. 
And then there's the African American Success Project that's occurring at Longfellow a Middle School. Um, in addition, we have our health center at the high school and some of the, the work that we're really starting to do around the MHSSA grant, which stands for Mental Health Student Support uh, Grant. So that's some of the work that we're doing there. Uh, we also have uh, approximated 500,000 has been designated for the mental health MOUs to offset the increase to the cost sites so that their uh, uh, costs uh, did not go up in 21-22 school year. Uh, so that money is being allocated to offset some of that cost. And we also have interns that are currently at King and Longfellow Middle School. Next slide, please. Okay, so I, I briefly talked about um, the support at the elementary schools. One of the things we want to focus on is ensuring that there was at least a 1.0 uh, FTE at each of the elementary schools. Um, those elementary schools that had more than a 1.0, they continue to have more than a 1.0. But we have currently a vacancy at John Muir, a recent vacancy at John Muir and Ruth Atkey. Um, those are both schools that are being supported by BACR. Uh, I'm working with BACR to fill those uh, uh, those sites with FTE and working on a plan to be able to continue to provide support for those students until that vacancy is filled. Um, we're gonna be bringing back the, uh, the MEET program, the Mental Health Peer Education Program to Berkeley High School. We're setting a target launch date of spring 2023. So we hope to get that uh, up and running uh, in January, um, hiring a, uh, a, a meet counselor to begin to run the program. And again, our target launch date for that is spring 2023. And then in terms of the MHSSA grant, uh, the steering committee has been working on the plan for uh, at least eight months, meeting regularly. And the, the plan is nearly complete. We're putting the final touches on the plan. It's unscheduled for submission to the MHSOAC, or also known as the state, at the end of September. And if approved, then the funding will begin shortly thereafter. And actually tomorrow, uh, we're holding interviews for the mental health coordinator position tomorrow. So we hope to have that position filled um, by the beginning of October, uh, second week of October, uh, to get the mental health coordinator onboarded uh, to begin the work as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so this particular slide is just some additional things that are taking place within student services. Um, yesterday, the entire student services team was able to participate in mental health first aid training with the Alameda County Office of Education. Um, I have my certificate here that I was able to achieve, but we are still talking about um, providing mental health uh, first aid training uh, to staff and students. So this is some of the things that are coming out of the MHSSA uh, plan, which you'll be hearing more about. Uh, there's also the continued supports around SEL curriculum that's taking place at the middle schools through their advisory lessons that are developed by the school counselors. And then at the elementary, there's the toolbox curriculum, um, which is a research-based community tested uh, kindergarten through sixth grade social and emotional learning program that builds and strengthens children's inherent capacity for resilience, self-mastery and empathy for self and others. The cool thing about Toolbox is that it's both prevention and intervention. The next slide, please. Okay, and then this last slide is uh, support that's provided to staff. Um, the district is, uh, has partnered with uh, Claremont EAP to provide free and confidential services uh, to BUSD staff and uh, family members of uh, BUSD staff. And so I have the 800 number up on the board and there's also Kaiser Permanente as well. Um, but again, uh, I mentioned it briefly, but Niroga Institute also provides some dynamic mindfulness training uh, to staff as well. So we obviously wanna to continue to support staff um, in addition to students um, around wellness. Let's see, next slide, please. Oh, so that's the end of my piece of the presentation. Back to you, Doc, uh, Superintendent. 
I love how people make me a doctor. At one, at some point, it's just going to be honorary and automatic. Um, uh, Ms. Hogan, if you can go back, uh, we're going to actually um, make a slight change and allow directors to engage in each chunk and ask questions um, because we know we have a lot that we're putting in this presentation. Um, so before passing it back to Madam President to open it up for questions, I did want to just um, highlight what I didn't say before, and I apologize. I did say uh, about how we're trying to be more responsive, and I hope that you were able to see in the format of the slides, how um, there was a slide that said, you know, requests or um, identified needs from June of 2022. Um, so the, the, the left-hand side tried to highlight some of the feedback that we received from community, from directors, or even some gaps and needs that we might've identified as a staff. And then the right-hand side was a status update to those things in particular, as well as some additional information. So I didn't say that um, in my opening frame, and so I apologize. I wanted to make sure folks saw that. We're not just sharing random things. We're trying to share and show um, that we heard you and the ways that we're trying to um, enhance and um, make some changes in response to that. I also hope that in Dr. Shelley's presentation, you heard some examples, um, both of those kind of tier one, if you will, practices, the things that are happening in the classroom. So uh, the social emotional curriculum, the mindfulness, uh, the training with teachers, and then also some examples of tier two or tier three, which are those services that are outside of the classroom. Um, examples of that are the additional support staff and counselors and the BHS Wellness Center. So wanted to um, highlight those and then pass it to Madam President um, to open it up for questions and comments from the board. Uh, thank you so much, Superintendent Ford Martel. Thank you for this opportunity to pause here for questions. Now, you know you ran through that really fast and you're gonna have to put that on slide <laughs> and present that to us so we can see that. Um, because I'm I have a, I'm gonna start off with questions and then go to the board directors and I'm sure that you maybe answered one of those questions, but the way my learning is set up, I need to see it on the slide. But anywho, um, uh, Dr. Shelley, thank you so much uh, for this first part of the presentation. I also want to take this opportunity um, to thank the uh, city who has partnered uh, with us on a mental health grant, um, and we were the recipients of that, and so I'm very grateful for that opportunity and, and happy to be able to have that partnership uh, with our city who wants to ensure that all of our students in BUSD are well. And so uh, I wanna pause and say thank you for that. Additionally, um, Dr. Shelley, and I think Superintendent Fort Morthel may have said it a little bit, so I may actually both to reiterate that, um, but I was happy to hear about what is happening in our elementary schools and what's happening at our middle schools. Um, but we know a lot of the challenges around mental health um, are also happening at the high school level. So I appreciated learning about the wellness centers, uh, but I want to also ask uh, if you all can highlight <clears throat> what else is happening or being done at the high school level uh, to support the, uh, or to ensure the mental well-being of all of our students there. Um, and if there is a plan um, moving forward for, to incorporate advisories um, at the high school, which is, what I've been advocating for for a little while. Um, and then my second, well, I'll cut, we'll do another round of questions and I'll come back for my second question. So we can answer that one and then I'll go to Vice President Babbitt for her first question. Thank you, Madam President. So I will try to respond um, to, to setting that for the part about BHS in particular. So I think some of the additional things that are happening at BS, BHS that I might have done quickly or might not have said at all uh, is that there are guidance counselors available um, to support our students, not just academically, but also their social, emotional, and personal well being. And so all BHS students should be assigned a guidance counselor for support. Um, and they actually have a counseling center where, where folks, where students can go to access and check in with those counselors. Um, in addition to that, there's um, the wellness center, and then there's individual and short-term counseling that's offered. There's crisis assessment that's offered, as well as emotional support and stress management. Um, there's consultation for our families as well, um, as well as our school staff, and referrals for ongoing mental health services and community resources. And so anyone at BHS can uh, submit a, a mental health referral to the health center uh, via a special a referral form and get access to those services. Um, I would also say that one of the things that, that we learned, so that's just kind of a short, kind of some of the additional things that we didn't share, um, but one of the things that we learned is that there um, were and a, a host of different um, resources and supports for students at BHS 
across all of our schools actually. And, and again, we've added to those, but one of the one of the issues or one of the barriers was, was information and folks actually knowing about these resources, but also knowing how to access these resources. And so I do wanna highlight that that is a focus of the administration. And uh, earlier this year, um, there was a welcome back assembly where the entire wellness team was able to present to all the students across grade levels to talk about some of the services and resources and also give a highlight of how to access those. That's not enough. We continue to try to make sure our students know where to go and who to talk to. And additionally, we had um, an event, uh, Why Ninth Grade Matters, where our families were also able to hear about the various services, mental health and otherwise at BHS, and also know how to access them. So I wanted to add that piece as well, that we're really working on being transparent and communication um, to make sure that folks know not just what's there, but how to access what's there as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Superintendent for Martel. Uh, Vice President Babbitt. Yes, thank you so much. I just wanted to um, take this opportunity to uh, thank Dr. Shelley again for being at the Mental Health Summit um, this past Saturday. Um, it was quite long, but um, a good listening session for us. And uh, we got some good tips and tools to get some marching orders to really hear directly from our high school students some of the things that um, they experienced in our schools um, with their mental health issues and things that they would like for us to um, to take so that we can give back and change those um, outcomes for other students. I want to thank Superintendent Mor Ford Morthel for being there. Also, Rosina, Karen, Karen and uh, Babalawa, who's always been, um, both have always been so amazing in making sure our kids get the direct services that they need to the best of their ability. Um, and really um, did some of that first line of work instructing our district on what trauma-informed care and instruction looks like. And so I'm looking forward to um, seeing how we can integrate more of that. And I also want to thank um, Dr. Mor Ford Morthel for really <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent for Morthel for really um, honing in on we really need to define what wraparound services truly look like and how do we make sure that the right students are getting the right services at, at the right time and how do we really um, make sure that we have the, the right partnerships with all of our communities, um, community partners who really know uh, what they have capacity to offer because the reality is we are out capacity like we are <laughs> we don't have the people uh, resources to really meet the demand of today um, post pandemic and so that is one of our strengths that um, we need to develop and so I'm looking forward to working with you all on that um, please as we start thinking about budgeting season um, what are the resources like what is the deep dive plan um, in addition to this grant uh, do we need more uh, people who can coordinate with our uh, community partners to make sure that we have that um, immediate access that we need for those wraparound services. So I'm not sure that's really a question, but it's definitely um, an expression of gratitude to all of you and my hopes for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Babbitt. Uh, Student Director Siegel and then Director Vasudev. I think Director Vasudev was first. I'm sorry, Director Vasudev. It's okay. Um, thank you, Student Director Siegel. <laughs> I, um, so what I did, thank you, Dr. Shelley, for your presentation. I definitely felt that you took some of the feedback. Um, I know I provided a lot of feedback in June around uh, group mental health, and so did uh, Director Sinai. So I love to see the incorporation of all these different um, group mental health opportunities, particularly for the high school. Um, and I know that we had a as part of that June conversation, the conversation around mental health first aid, because that's something that other neighboring districts have done. And right now I know that OUSD and that SFUSD is also um, trying to, you know, bringing in different service providers for, for um, you know, a mental health first aid. So love to see that. I love to see that incorporated in this plan. One of the um, feed, one of the points of feedback that I had given in June, I don't see here, and I'm wondering if um, that's something that's still being developed, but I remember uh, that the staff from the multilingual program had flagged that there had been a group called uh, Young Adults Living Life that had provided group mental health to the students in the multilingual program at the high school um, because they needed multilingual support. And also a lot of them were coming from countries where they're facing extreme trauma. They're either undocumented, here alone. 
um, you know, separated from their families and some of them have lost relatives due to the pandemic and that there had been a, an existing partnership before for a group mental health provider, a multilingual provider. In the case of the high school, it had been a Spanish uh, bilingual provider that was working with the students uh, to provide group mental health. And I know that there were issues also around insurance plans um, being required at the high school. And that was another barrier for that particular subgroup of students, the students in the multilingual program. And so I wanted to know what kind of thinking there was about <laughs> mental health, particularly for the multilingual students in the high school's multilingual program. Okay, so I, I didn't want to get out in front of it, but one of the things that we're looking at that we've added into the uh, MHSSA plan is the creation of another position, a navigator position that would work directly with families uh, to ensure that they're able to access um, and what their capacities are, be able to access uh, the resources that they need. And so in addition to the mental health coordinator position, there's, there'll also be the creation of a uh, a navigator position that's, that specifically is able to work uh, with students and their families to make sure they can access that. Um, and then also going back to some of our community partners and making sure that they have the capacity to be able to uh, address some of the things that you just mentioned. So that is some additional work for me to do, but I am happy about the navigator a position that is being uh, written into the MHSSA uh, grant plan. That's great. Yeah, I'd love to know what the direct uh, peer, you know, the direct group mental health service would look like for the high schoolers. We get follow up later on that. Um, and then I, I know that we have a new superintendent, associate superintendent, so I'm happy to, to forward the correspondences from June uh, so we can touch base on that later. But thank you, Dr. Shelley, for a great presentation. Um, student director Ian, you were next. Oh, thank you. Um, I one thing was that um, from Superintendent for Morthel when you were saying that uh, the guidance counselors were assigned to students. Is that are they all assigned to all students, or is there like a specific breakdown of this guidance counselor goes to this specific set of students? Um, yeah, is it like broken down individually, or is that like that? Yep, so my understanding, Director Siegel, is that every student has a guidance counselor assigned and they're assigned actually, I believe, by last name. Um, I can confirm that and re reply to you again, but that was that was not only what I learned at the wellness, at the welcome back assembly, but also I think what I was told. So let me verify that and figure out how that exact assignment is given. Okay, I think that would be great to com be communicated to students too on a little bit, maybe possibly on the student bulletin, because when students like are shown that they fall within someone's uh like jurisdiction it almost it opens it, let, it lets them go to them where it feels like they um can go to that person as they've been designated to that person we've seen it with like the um academic counselors students go to them often because they are designated them within their uh like last name breakdown um and then another thing was um for Dr. Shelley, for back in June, you presented to the board on the steering committee's survey to the community, and they found specific targeted needs of the community. And I was wondering if, maybe not now, but um, at a later time, if you would be able to share those specific needs with um, the board and the community. I think it'd be great if we could see those. Yeah, I, I would love to have an opportunity to continue the discussion. Um, I just wanted to just uh, clarify something. The, the mental health steering committee did not uh, do a survey to the community. What the steering committee did was took existing surveys, some of the surveys um, from the CSAS, uh surveys that were done with different uh, community groups, parents and students, in addition to the Healthy Kids survey, and they were able to look at uh, that data and then through that data shift through some of the, the things that we saw as specific needs. And then also some of the lessons learned, folks coming into the, to the committee um, as we were transitioning from the uh, the pandemic to back to in-person learning. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shelley, I wanted to ask, I'm sorry that I'm not available by video, my computer died, but um, I wanted to ask, you know, additionally talk about our lessons learned. Um, I know that screening for our students um, 
is one of the best ways uh, to offer um, our mental health support or to be able to capture students who are in need of mental health support. Um, and so in addition to the Healthy Kids Survey, um, is there any additional direction that has been provided from the state uh, that we are adopting? Or have we thought about um, additional opportunities for screening? What are your thoughts on that? Yes, absolutely. So as, as again, part of the MHS, MHSSA plan that we're, that we're, that's going to be approved. We're talking about uh, providing the sites, screening tools uh, to be able to screen for students. So right now, you know, the students go through the, uh, uh, the cost teams and then they get referred through their cost teams, but providing uh, the, the screening tools. So that's something that is in development in the MHSSA plan, uh, which will be implemented uh, once it's approved by the state. Awesome. Thank you so much. We know that screening will really make the difference um, for our young people and receiving the mental health support that they need. So I'm happy to hear um, that you are on this as well as on top of this, as well as a, a lot of other things. So thank you so much for um, this part of the presentation and Superintendent for Morthel, I'll turn it back over to you for part two. Thank you for that. Um, Jill, we can go to slide nine. So the next component of our um, presentation as we think about uh, our student wellness and safety is uh, school safety. We've divided school safety into two sections, uh, preparation and facilities. And we have John Calis, who is gonna present this slide um, to our community. John. Great, thank you, Superintendent Ford Marthel. Good evening, everybody. So as the superintendent mentioned, we're gonna talk about two separate items, the preparation of what we're doing and then what we've done in facilities. On preparation, um, as you know, we've been working with a school safety consultant um, and they have just, are they're in the process of completing uh, all of the school safety plans. Each school has a safety plan. These were written over the years, but what we've done is we've had the company come in to actually really look at our safety plans to update them, but more importantly, they're reflecting current and relevant information, but they're also, they're, there's a continuity now that's been created across the district, um, as opposed to before a lot of these safety plans were written by individual sites and they lacked that continuity, which was problematic as different teams moved from site to site. Um, there's capacity with building and training. We've been working with our ed services team as well as our professional development folks to do training of staff on response for natural and other disasters. And then we're also right now working on security officer training. We've um, bolstered, I would say, our partnership with BPD and other city agencies. We have opened our facilities for training for BPD and BFD. We, the board just approved a little while back the MOU with the Berkeley Fire Department outdoor warning system that'll be placed on school facilities across the district. And then there's a number of other issues or another under, excuse me, a number of other uh, initiatives that we've been working on to really work with BPD around safety at our schools. Um, systems and structures, it's really about building a culture of, of safety and security and routines. Um, and what that is, is it's, it's so important that we impress upon all of our school administrators as we have been, that a lot of the culture and the safety starts there in the campuses and it's understanding practices and expectations that should be done by all students and staff. Um, from a facilities perspective, Columbine locks have been installed on all K-12 classrooms across the district. This was done uh, 2019, 2020, and into the very beginning of 2021. Uh, we're continuing to improve surveillance. Uh, we're adding more cameras and we're currently investigating ways to actually enhance these features and to use the programs that are available uh, to their full potential. Right now, the facilities department is undergoing uh, all of our standards, updating our standards, and we're also doing the district security standards. Those security standards are being integrated into all new construction as well as modernizations. Um, an example of some of these standards could include access controls, types of doors, gates, et cetera. Um, and then there's the issue with open campuses. Berkeley has a lot of very old, but a, very, a lot of very beautiful campuses and they were all built as open campuses. And through modernizations, we're making concerted effort to really make more, our campuses more safe and secure. Um, we've done this with West Campus. We've done modernizations at other schools. We're currently in design for Sylvia Mendez and Longfellow. 
Um, so we are looking at trying to create a little bit more of a closed campus while also still allowing it to have that open feel that the community absolutely uh, cherishes. Last and not least, we've done a threat and vulnerability assessment and this has been completed and it's under review. Um, it's important to note this assessment is a legally privileged document and that's why we haven't published it. But what this does is this was the uh, consultant coming in and really looking at the district uh, in a very granular level, but also very holistically, right? Just straight across the board, what do they see um, and help identify any of those threats or vulnerabilities for us. Um, so with that, I apologize, a little tired, didn't mean to stumble on my words, but I'll definitely be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Vice President Babbitt, okay. would you like to begin with your question? All right, thank you so much, uh, um, Executive Director John Calise for this presentation. And I didn't think you stumbled at all. I thought you did an excellent job explaining to us the, the work that's being done. So thank you for this work. Um, my questions relate to the um, commission that we had a year ago. Um, it was a part of the resolution to really look at um, the safety resource officers that we have on campus and the recommendations that came out of that task force. I know Dr. Shelley, um, you led that task force. Um, so when you were talking about how we're partnering with um, the Berkeley Police Department and other city agencies, that task force had some recommendations there. And so I'm just wondering, are we still moving forward with any of those recommendations or do we need to uh, revive and, and review and give direction if that's what the board would like to see happen? Yeah, with that one, I would actually have to pitch to Dr. Shelley. So the, the school resource officers, while they do fall under safety, it's, it's a different aspect of safety and it's not something that falls under facilities. That is student services. I. I honestly can't answer that. I don't know if Dr. Shelley is prepared to answer that this evening. Yeah, no, no. Um, yeah, we would need to revisit, you know, some of the the, uh, the recommendations that have been implemented. Some of the recommendations were for immediate implementation. Some were for uh, a, a few years out, and then some were our ultimate goal of where we wanted to ultimately end up. And so let me uh, follow back up with the team at Berkeley High School and then I'll be able to share that out. Great, thank you so much. And then um, just wanna say that I'm, I'm happy to see that we're updating our standards to be integrated into our new constructions, um, but I also wanna know about some of the soft things that we can do now to ensure that our, um, that our schools are safe, that we're monitoring doors that have been propped open, that we have um, procedures in place so that our um, safety officers really understand where our threats are um, and can work on mitigating those risks. Yeah, so that's the piece that I did touch on about the systems and structures. It's really just about working with our school site administrators to understand the safety and security concerns as well as those routines and really just building a culture and climate of accountability, right? Of if we see the doors are propping them open, not only making sure that they're closed, but if we see a student or staff member who is propping them open, it's about educating them why we shouldn't, right? Right now, I don't believe um, the district has the, the additional manpower to station people at each doors, for example, at the high school, but it's really just about being cognizant that this is an ongoing issue and trying to train students and staff to make sure that this isn't happening. If I can add, Director Babbitt, a, a couple of things that some of the sites have been trying to do, and, and some of this is, is not new, but something we're trying to, uh, as, as John said, just kind of make a consistent practice at Berkeley High School being the last uh, school I heard named um, is, as you all might um, know, the closing and the and the, um, the closing of gates. There's many entry points into Berkeley High School, um, and so after first period, for multiple reasons, one of which is safety and being able to monitor who's coming in, and uh, mostly who's coming in, but also who's going off the campus. Those uh, those doors and, and gates are closed, and students then have one entry point um, at a certain period. Um, after the beginning of first period, shouldn't have said period twice. Um, also asking not just uh, safety monitors, but also administrative staff to be out and roaming. Um, again, just to kind of monitor and, and keep track of making sure the folks who are on campus should be on campus. And then like um, John said, really reminding um, students and teachers um, 
who have the best of intentions to make sure that we're not, we're trying to do our friend a favor by propping the door open. Let's not do that. Let's keep those doors closed, particularly during those hours of instruction happening. Some of the things uh, at the, the younger grades in our, in our K-8 schools is really trying to institute the practice of making sure that our guests actually stop at the front office and sign in. And so we, we love our community. We want to be open. We want to be inclusive. And we want to make sure, again, that we're able to see and know who's on campus, when they are on campus, where they are on campus, and when they leave. And so we're really requesting that all visitors, including our families, some of whom we know, stop at the office and sign in and get a name badge um, uh, and, and be clear to actually go wherever they are deciding or wanting to go on the campus. Um, we're also making sure or trying to institute the practice of our principals and our teachers and our um all of our administrators and many staff being out um, in front of the school at the beginning of the day, um, at the end of the day for pickup, when we know these are times for large volumes of traffic and folks moving on and off campus. So those are just a few examples of, of what John was mentioning in terms of those uh, systems and structures. And I would say, or I would add that's in the red here on the slide, that it's really important that all the members of the school community really respect and adhere to these routines. For some of these sites, actually enforcing these things are new. Um, and, and we really ask that our families and our students, to the point that John just made, are really conscious of the why that why we're doing these things um, and really adhere to, to the expectations that staff has put forward. Director Vasudev. Yeah, thank you so much, Director Kalise, for your um, presentation. I um, have a question actually for the superintendent. I know that... Um, the board passed a school safety resolution in June uh, that I drafted along with uh, President Brown. And um, in that resolution, uh, we, we asked that the superintendent make a recommendation to the board sometime during the school year as to whether or not we should establish a district-wide safety committee uh, made up of classified staff, certificated staff, the board, students, um, you know, parents, to come together and to kind of bridge that un that understanding that you're talking about, Superintendent, right? Making sure that we are all aligned in creating a culture of safety in our schools. And so my question is, um, when can we expect that recommendation, right? And I, some districts have combined, uh, have you know set forth a, a, a committee, but combined it with like their facility subcommittee. So it's not like a separate standalone committee. Some districts have made it their own standalone committee. And in Berkeley, uh, you know, our diversity is our strength as a community. And one of the things that I've really loved is that parents, um, you know, have stepped up like in former years at the PTA council, we had a parent that worked for the fire department who kind of, you know, led all the PTAs and being able to fund um, addi additional safety measures at their schools. Obviously, um, you know, having <laughs> safety being funded by by the PTA versus, you know, by the central office is, is also like from an equity perspective, not always, not always great. But all that to say that we do have a highly engaged community, particularly around safety issues, physical safety issues at our schools. And so, um, you know, I would love to know, uh, Superintendent, when you think that recommendation can come before the board, and if you have any thoughts, or you know, when you when you'd be able to to share any thoughts that perhaps you and Director Police would have on what that committee could look like for our district, so that we're all aligned on creating this culture of safety. Thank you. So at some point, my newness will no longer be what I can use. But as you know, Director Vasudev, I am doing the 90 day listening and learning. And so um, I would just, you know, my honest answer is that there would not be, I would not feel comfortable making a recommendation to the board around this uh, committee. Um, and so after that 90 days of listening and learning happens, because within those 90 days, um, not only am I listening to um, our community, which I'm already hearing that folks um, are feeling tapped. There are so many committees and so many ways to participate, which people love and I think folks feel torn and pulled with so many different ways to participate. So really a part of what I'm listening and learning for is where are those efficiencies? Um, where are we redundant? And actually to learn what committees we have and, and where, if anywhere, this work is already happening that we could just add to or if a separate committee um, is needed. So um, I'm kind of answering the question already. I, I do think that this is a, a great idea, but again, me figuring out this, my recommendation will only come after I've engaged in a little bit more listening and learning, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Student Director Siegel, I think I saw your hand. Thank you. Um, I know with all the safety procedures, um, a lot of students are having a little bit of angst surrounding them, but I think what would be great to, I think the superintendent's earlier point was to be um, so that we can communicate to the community 
the effects of this. So I was wondering if we could publish data, any data, if there's any data around um, in attendance at Berkeley High. A lot of students are taking issue with um, the doors closing right away after the bell. Um, but I think that it would help, a lot of students are also asking for this, but it would help students in the community see where the district is coming from if we can publish that data. Thank you for that recommendation. I will definitely talk to Principal Regosa about that. Um, I don't know if there's already some plans to do that internally or on the Berkeley website, but we'll definitely consider that um, and appreciate the recommendation. I believe that uh, we're done with questions from the Board of Education for that portion. Shall we continue with the rest of the presentation and go into Title IX next, right? Yes, our next section and our last section is, um, is uh, again, uh, thinking about all the different ways our babies feel safe, seen, and well. And so um, we have Ms. Yasmina, who was going to be presenting to us on our um, ways of responding to and being preventative as we think about Title IX. So Yasmina. Thank you, Superintendent, and thank you all for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to try not to slur, but at least it's not 1130, so we're good, improvement. Um, so I just wanted to, thank you for the slide. Um, so I wanted to say that we, I, I framed the slides against the student requests that stemmed from the 2020 walkouts and that have evolved over the years. And so I wanted to kind of compare of what was requested by our students um, and then where we are kind of today. So I, um, the request came in kind of three areas or they could be grouped into three different areas. And the first one being the capacity building of not only the Title IX office, but of all of the staff and administrators on how to adequately respond to reports of sexual harassment and harm on campus. Um, and so as a result of this, going into this year, um, I'm very proud to say that all of our training for our BHS administrators and our staff happened before school started so that we were already on day one. And you can see some of the trainings that are included on the right hand side of the slide, but part of that was also to establish Title IX focal points both in our middle schools and the high school, which includes um, administrators that have attended specialized trainings on civil rights investigations and sexual harassment investigations. And so basically they have sort of, they are the focal points, right? For all of such cases. And it is easier to coordinate cases. It is easier to know who to go to. And also it kind of relieves the pressure of all of our administrators always being on point with such cases. Um, so that's as far as the capacity building, we're going to continue doing that, um, hopefully every year before the school year starts so that we're ready. Um, and then as um, one part of our public comments tonight, we did have a massive training for all of our staff at high school, which included a training on sexual misconduct, um, which included appropriate behavior between our adults, our staff, and our students. And this is kind of, it goes along with our brand new board policy, which we can talk about in another time. Um, the second kind of portion of the request that came from the students was to ensure funding by the district for prevention programs such as our con consent ed education, Green Dot, and Coaching Boys into Men. And this is something that we started last year. We're continuing this year with some staffing challenges, but nevertheless, it, the, the money is there and it's not going anywhere. This is from the generosity, both of our Board of Education, our general fund, and as well as BSEP and different kind of development groups that we are funding. So I'm hopeful that by November, all three of these will be up and running, including our consent education for Berkeley High School independent study students and um, BTA students. The last and probably my favorite part of the demands that came in from the students are about raising awareness, not only about how to report and how to access these um, protective measures, which our multiple procedures define, um, but also to kind of hear what the students need. And so to create, to establish this two-way communication between the district and our kids, right? And as um, President Brown said, they are really creme de la creme. So it's that we really should listen to them because they have a lot of wonderful ideas. And so if we can just advance the slide. Oh, thank you. Um, so as part of that, um, this was my favorite part because it really allowed me to spend a lot of time with our students and especially some of our student organizations like the Berkeley 
uh, Student Women Union, BHS Stop Harassing, um, Green Dot, and then also our leadership, so the Women's Commissioner position, our Commissioner for Health and Athletics, um, our wonderful student director last year, this year. And so together with them, I listening to kind of what they wanted and what they needed and how to make this very complicated process simple. Um, so we created a lot of materials that are on the Berkeley High website, and then that will also be, as of next week, all over Berkeley High um, in paper. So this includes kind of information about definition of consent, what it is, how to report sexual harassment at Berkeley High, what are the different Title IX steps and procedures, and all of the things like what to expect once you go into the process. Um, and then also sign kind of some history around Title IX as this year was the 50th anniversary. Um, and then kind of moving forward, if we can advance slide. Um, we do have some challenges and that's obviously always going to be staffing, but that's not specific to us. That is always going to be when you work in public education, um, you're going to have some issues in hiring, but that does not mean that we are without um, help in some of these positions. So even though we're currently hiring for a Title IX investigator, we have an interim investigator in place, so we're not understaffed or all alone and crying in our office, um, but we do have some outside help, including our Title IX advisor, our off counsel, and of course our interim investigator. Um, what I'm sort of the most proud of this year is the Title IX Student Support Counselor. This is a new position that came into place as a result of student and staff advocacy at Berkeley High. Um, and it basically is designed to provide mental health support to our students that have experienced harm and even perpetrated harm um, going through the process and also after the process is over, our investigative process. And so the Title IX Student Support Counselor is something that you don't usually see in a K through 12 setting. You don't even see it usually at a higher ed setting. So I'm very proud that we are actually leading the way in that regard in Berkeley, which is very representative of our students and what where they kind of see us where we need to be. Um, moving forward, I think that what we want to do, of course, we still have, you know, to work to do as far as the um, requests that our students have made. But I think moving forward, our goal will be to institutionalize all of the progress that we've made so far. And that is to say to kind of move away from consultant-based consent education and to kind of see if we can somehow do it in-house so that it's more sustainable and so that we also have um, more longevity to it and to build upon what we have done so far and then also to build capacity about uh, with our student groups and our um, sex student sexual har harassment advisory committee um, as well as the gender equity sexual harassment committee which is a community committee um, so this is something just to kind of contribute to the conversation that is a two-way conversation between our students our community and ourselves that is the end of our title one I'm sorry title nine section but yeah I mean I think there was one event that you wanted to um, highlight yeah. and share with our community yes and it's it's a bonus event for all of the people that are still listening <laughs> um, so Miss um, Bracamontes who is the vice principal at Berkeley High School for climate and wellness um, her and I are organizing um, a title nine kind of awareness event at Berkeley High um, on October 2nd, but don't quote me 100% on the dates, they all are blurring. Um, and then the week before that, we are going to have a community meeting and informational for the parents at Berkeley High so they can come and ask Ms. Brocamontes uh, and me about the purpose of such events or any other title nine questions which they may have. And I understand that it's not a easy process to understand and I'm going to try to make it as approachable as possible um, just because there's like multiple nuances multiple laws um, depending on where things happen um, but so uh, look out for that email it's going to come through the community Berkeley High community email and it's going to be next week sometime maybe Thursday <laughs>
Sorry for not knowing the exact date. Okay, don't quote her, but I did want the community to hear as we talk about, again, one of our strategies is about making sure folks have the information um, and that those folks are not just staff and students, but also families as well. Um, so we're gonna pause. I have one more slide to talk about some of our considerations, but wanted to allow questions around um, the Title IX updates that Yasmina just provided. So Madam President. Yes, thank you. That's actually a perfect segue um, into my question because um, I'm really excited about the increased peer-to-peer um, -peer education and the increased um, training and education for our faculty and staff. But I know that we do this work in partnership with our families. Um, and so I was wondering, I'm, I'm happy to hear about the event, but I was wondering if you could highlight ongoing opportunities um, to train our, our families or keep our families uh, in the know or updated um, in our, with our updated on our efforts towards Title IX, or for Title IX rather. So thank you for that question. That's actually a really good. I didn't get into the details of it. But as we did last year, we had um, our consent education for the for our high school students also included um, parent consent education because it's one thing to teach a child about consent, but it's also very important to kind of help our community speak to kids about consent in everyday life in an age appropriate manner. So as a result of this year's consent education that we're going to be doing for our high schools, um, we're also going to have at least two sessions for our community um, where they can log in and also kind of understand what we teach kids in regards to consent. Sorry, it's so hard to click the unmute button on this phone. <laughs> I don't know if it's the chubby fingers or the, anyway, let's keep going. Uh, Vice President Babbitt, go ahead with your question. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for all of your hard work and uh, for the ways in which um, you're working with our community to be so well embraced. So that is greatly appreciated. Um, I had a question about, um, two questions. One, um, last year I attended um, one of our teachers' um, consent education classes, and I learned all about fries, and it was so good. But then I learned that um, it's not necessarily um, systematized in a way that we're, we're confident that every child is getting that instruction um, and, and the different points at, at when they get it or... Say, for example, they came to our school in 11th grade, but it only happened in 9th grade. Um, and the fact that our teachers are, were, were really saying that we, we have to re repeat, refresh uh, this information often. Um, so is there a plan to, to make sure that it um, hits, say, every English class or every, you know, a certain time that we know that we're going over that? So that's one question. And then my favorite, of course, our boundary policy. <laughs> I heard you say we'll get back to that, but that was actually what I wanted to ask about. How are we um, making sure that our staff understand the policy and um, do they have some of these user-friendly um, kinds of um, ways to, to use it as a resource? And, okay, who came up with consent is hot, assault is not? Me. <laughs> <laughs> No, I actually, um, that was my wonderful design, but it is, there's multiple like slogans that are, this is just, so the consent posters are going to be four of them in a series, and this is just one. Um, and so it is, there's like other schools use them. And so I, I was warned that I shouldn't make anything too funny because then it would be like, you know, as Director Siegel can tell you, not funny at all. Um, so it was, so I had, I think, an option of eight, and then our students kind of went through it, and we were like, you need to toss this one out, and then this one's okay. So these are the last four That's things. what I was trying to figure out. Did the students really think that was cool? I don't know. You know, I'm getting old. I don't know. <laughs> but good job. Um, and then my other two questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so you're right. So currently, um, our, uh, our middle school children and our high school children do have incorporated consent education within. So in middle schools, it goes into more mostly into like science classes. And then I, uh, high school, it is at freshman year, you have this huge assembly. Um, and then you have it in English classes for the other grades. And so while this model is great, I think it leaves out our 
baby's babies in a sense of like, you can start teaching consent and boundaries and appropriate behavior with students, not in the matter of like sexual consent, but in general, even at a lower grades. And so I think while I, our elementary schools do touch upon that, we can definitely have a more uniform approach to that. And this is something that I have started working on first kind of realize, trying to figure out what we currently do, what is the state of affairs and then where we can improve. Um, so as far as our older kids, so high school forward, there's consent education, at least for the last two years, we've had it um, every year. Uh, this year, my goal is to complete the consent education by December, because last year it kind of took a little bit longer, um, just so that we have kind of a smaller time frame, and it does go in our English classes for high school. So I think um, that there's definitely room for improvement in a sense of how to have it uniformed and how to have like an approach across the district. Um, and that's something that's on my to-do list for this year. Um, but the kids are receiving repeated consent education at this point um, in some form. And then for the boundary policy, so for, I was hoping you weren't gonna ask me, but there you were. <laughs> So for the boundary policy, um, I know that I have some training set up for um, like I've, I've been invited to some like smaller departments in the high school to talk about it. Um, but I think that what assist, uh, um, Assistant Superintendent Tobias and I are going to do is probably create some pamphlets in some form of a more of a summary of the policy so that all of our staff know where to find it, what it entails, and how, what does that mean in their everyday job? Thank you. And I, I definitely suggest making some videos, you know, that we could push out to our, our parent, our staff about it. And um, I have another question, but I will wait for uh, Director Siegel. So thank you. Student Director Siegel, whenever you're ready. Uh, Vice President Babbitt asked my question, but I just really wanted to thank you, Yasmina, for all that you've done for students in PUSD. Um, you've listened to student wants and student demands. You've followed through on your promises to us. You've given us updates. Um, you've listened to us. You've given us uh, a lot of our demands. I really um, appreciate this work on behalf of all students. We really do appreciate your work. Um, know that we are constantly thinking of you and we all, all will always be thinking of you as our favorite Title IX coordinator. Um, and I really hope that we can make these updates a recurring thing uh, so we can constantly be um, at the forefront of Title IX challenges. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I wasn't slurring before. Now I'm definitely going to slur and cry as I do as I do this. But thank you. For me, I really believe in our student body. I think that everything that we have achieved in my office in the past nine months that I've been here um, has been directly because of your advocacy. And I think that you are a group of very intelligent, very smart, very eloquent. That's why you keep winning the debate teams. And it's very hard to say no to you. So um, I think none of this would be where it is without your and your and the alumni is obviously can't forget them um, without your commitment to this. So thank you. That was beautiful, Yasmina. Um, Director Vasudev. No, oh, I don't have. Um, well, I guess like a quick question, but um, just more more than questions, just comments. Thank you so much, Yasmina, for your presentation and for the way that you're co-creating content with students, because I think that's very important. And I agree, our students are our strength. So the fact that you're doing that together with them, right, this content is supposed to be useful for them. And so that you're working together is really important. Um, I just have a request for the for our superintendent, if she can share the materials with the board, I think it'd be great when once they're developed. And if you do produce videos, um, also share with the board so we can see right like what the, the information that our students are seeing and I think also with our parents like you know they want to know uh, the BHS PTSA definitely wants to know so like what's happening in the school I think that's really important and probably with the PTA council too right um and then I don't know uh, if board members are allowed at that event next week but I would love to attend if possible so send me information please <laughs> I'll try to squeeze you guys in, but <laughs> you're like, it's not for you, but I'll try to squeeze you in. <laughs> but um, just, yeah, really appreciate all your great work. And again, all I, all I hear is, you know, great feedback from our students and from our families about how you engage with them. So thank you so much. Thank you. 
And Vice President Babbitt, back to you for your final question. Thank you so much. My final question re relates back to um, the caller, um, the public commenter, Rebecca Levinson, when she was uh, saying that we should, she made a, a um, suggestion about lowering our threshold. Can, can you tell us more about um, what she meant and how we could actually serve to do that? Yeah, so I think that, um, and this is something that is not necessarily, you know, our fault. This is California law. And so when we have teachers that have, you know, committed some form of sexual harm to our students, the procedure for dismissal of our teacher is something, teacher is it's something that's regulated by the California Educational Code. And so it is a 10 step process, which, you know, like if you are talking about a tenured teacher and if you're talking about somebody being dismissed as a result of a, a, a charge that's less than sexual assault and harm, it makes sense, right? Because it's, it's, it's a due process. However, in instances of sexual harm, um, this 10 step process can be sometimes more harmful to the kids because they would have to continue testifying in all of these different stages of the process. Um, and so it's not very victim friendly, right? So um, for us to kind of advocate for change at state level that would say this is the way that you would dismiss an offending teacher is, is great. It's a 10 step process. It's wonderful. However, in cases of sexual assault or severe sexual harm, there needs to be a different procedure that doesn't take three to four years and that, you know, can be done quicker with less harm to our students. And I think that there should be some offenses and some charges that um, should have a different kind of more uh, a shorter procedure just because of the nature of the charge and I think that's what the comment was towards and like where we as a school district would stand in kind of advocating for something like that. That sounds great maybe that's something our um, new committee our new advisory committee once it starts in October could help us form and develop. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, Mina, I don't think there are any other questions from the Board of Education for you, but I do just want to join my board colleagues um, in telling you thank you so much for all of your incredible work. You've jumped right in. It feels like we've had you around for nine years, even though it's only been nine months, but thank you so much for the work that you continue to do. And I want to also um, take this opportunity to thank uh, Vice President Babbitt and Director Alper and their work in the policy committee on our boundary, uh, boundary policy. Uh, and we continue to try to do the work and make the efforts to make the difference for our young people. So thank you so much. Superintendent Formworthdale. Thank you, Madam President. So we are now on the last slide. And before I share this, I, I, I too want to uh, celebrate um, Yasmina. And I also want to just recognize and appreciate Dr. Shelley and John Cleese as well, as well as just our amazing staff at the central and site levels, because none of these uh, enhancements, none of these additions, uh, these grants, and none of what you saw this this evening um, is possible without the hard work of our staff, um, both those who are developing these things in collaboration and those who are implementing. And then, of course, as Yasmina said, our students. So I um, just want to celebrate, the, you know, I, I can't take any credit for it. I just got here, but I'm going to go ahead and just say, yeah, we did it. Um, but there's so much work still for us to do. And so we want to be really transparent and honest with community that even though um, we've tried our best to respond um, and put a lot of new things in place um, and enhance the things that we had previously. There are still a lot of challenges and constraints, if you will, and considerations that we just want to make sure um, are known um, as we try to do this work. It is a, is an ongoing struggle, and I think the first one to highlight is one that Director Babbitt mentioned earlier. And, and there's just there's there's tension, right, with all the needs that we see, um, and and the staffing and the ability to actually have people on the ground in our sites to address these needs, and so. Just wanted to call out that we continue to struggle um, with, with staff, and that is across, you know, providing mental health and wellness supports to our students, to um, Title IX supports, as Yasmin I mentioned, in terms of the vacancies that we have, but even thinking about security officers and just more people on the campus to think about how we can monitor and make sure our schools are physically safe. I would add to that that it's also not just BUSD staff. 
that is in shortage, but I was at that mental, um, the mental health and wellness summit um, this past weekend, like Director Babbitt said, and even some of our, our, our partners, right, in the community were talking about just their challenges with staffing positions as well. And if you think about, you know, the school and what teachers are trained to do, we love our babies and we want to provide that social emotional support. And that's not always our areas of expertise or Title IX is not always our ex areas of expertise. So a, a struggle is not just filling positions, but also finding folks who know the stuff, who, who actually have deep expertise and knowledge in these areas and can really provide supports to our students and our staff. So I wanted to call that out. Um, another challenge that we continue to face, even though we have been successful in applying for and being awarded uh, multiple grants, is that the um, in some of these areas, uh, particularly thinking about the social, emotional, and wellness, there's increasing costs that are associated with this. And so just trying to keep up with the need and, and providing the services and the increasing and the ongoing cost of these services continues to be a challenge. Um, as well as the fact that some of the funding sources are soft funding sources, which means it is a grant or it is for a year or two years. And so we're thinking about how do we start these things and, and, and not start them and then stop them when the money runs out. But how are we thinking down the line and being strategic to make sure that we have the, the funds available to sustain these efforts um, for the long term? And then, of course, there's the resource of time as we think about the open campuses that uh, that Mr. Khalees talked about and the modernization efforts just really in all transparency, that doesn't just require money, it also requires time. So even if we had all the dollars to, 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 to you know, enhance every single building, right, th th that's months and years down the line. So we wanted to just name those as really, you know, clear and true challenges. The other one specifically, I think about um, mental health supports, and even the Title IX is just the need for us to continue to work hard and do better with the coordination of care. How do we partner with our community partners, our city um, officials and partners to really provide the best and the most services for our students? Because everything cannot um, happen at the school site and everything cannot be um, the onus of the classroom teachers and the staff who are in the building. So how do we really work together and figure out our locus of um, control and our, our spheres of influence um, within the school day and beyond the school day? And then finally, in all transparency, I think I opened by talking about how we're trying to think about these issues um, at various tiers or at various levels. So it's what happens in the classroom and then what happens for those uh, babies or circumstances that need support and resource um, beyond the capacity of the classroom. And so we are being transparent in that in BUSD, some of our work this year is really thinking about um, and getting clear on the different levels of support thinking about what triggers um, more, you know, more support. Um, what do we provide every student? What do we provide you know, certain students at a different level? And so just naming that that is a conversation that we're having, that we have not come to a place where I can say that every staff or every person in BUSD understands tier one, tier two, tier three, and when supports are triggered and what supports happen at each level. And so that's something that we're committing to our community um, to figure out and get really clear and transparent about. And as we think about sharing information, that will be part of the information that we share. So um, we appreciate all of your time. We appreciate your thoughtful questions. Again, I, I am excited about the work that we are doing, but we are in no way, shape or form trying to say that we are doing enough. We have a lot more work to do, um, but I hope that you see that this team is committed to doing that work with input from our students and in collaboration with you all and community. So thank you for your time. Thank you as well, Superintendent for Morthel. Uh, thank you, Coordinator Mateskic. Thank you, Direct, uh, Dr. Shelley. And thank you, Executive Director Khalees for all of your phenomenal work. Uh, we have reached the end of our presentation with no more questions from board directors. Um, and so we are going to let you staff go home. Um, but, oh, sorry, before we do that, we need to actually go to the second opportunity for public comment. So if there are any public commenters, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand so that you may be recognized and given an opportunity to speak to the Board of Education. Okay. I do not see any hands raised. Vice President Babbitt, can you um, double check for me because I am on my phone, so I don't want to miss anyone. Do you see any hands raised? No, you are correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We'll move to second opportunity for board member comments. All right, hearing none, we will now adjourn. Thank you all so much and have an excellent evening. Goodbye. Right, thank you.